if you do the same thing over and over and over again, you just practice backhand after backhand, somebody keeps hitting after backhand, you get much better at it. Uh, then the question is, well, when you're really playing, though, you don't get backhand after backhand after backhand. Typically, you're having to switch back and forth. That When you're training somebody who uh, doesn't know anything, you can't place yourself back in that situation when you yes. don't know anything. And uh, you see it in academia all the time. Uh, when you read something over and over, you believe you really know it. Uh, because after all, it's very familiar. You're looking at the page. But until you can answer questions about it, do you really know it? If you can't answer questions, you really didn't know it. You might have had the illusion that you knew it perfectly. Today on Sage Exchange, we talked to Roddy Rodiger. He's a co-author of this book here, Make It Stick, The Science of Successful Learning. And obviously, this is a topic dear to Sage, our own organization, and to our clients, because we care about how people teach and learn in the workplace. Roddy gave us really interesting insights in all the different ways in which people go about learning the wrong way and some of what the science of learning is showing us for how to go about learning the right way. Uh, enjoy the conversation and do, if you're at all interested in this topic, pick up this book, absolutely comes recommended by us. Enjoy the conversation. For the most part, we're going about learning in the wrong ways and we're giving poor advice to those who are coming up behind us. A great deal of what we think we know about how to learn is taken on faith and based on intuition, but does not hold up under empirical research. Persistent illusions of knowing lead us to labor at unproductive strategies. Yes. Uh, so the, even some college websites say, or used to say, when we wrote the book, uh, which is now about 10 years ago, um, that the way you should do things is to repeat them, uh, read a chapter, read it again, uh, to essentially uh, master practice, uh, that memory is like a muscle and you do the same thing over and over and that will help. And those things are, I mean, they work in the short term. Uh, if you have a test tomorrow, reading a chapter over and over, especially if it's a multiple choice type test, we'll get you through but you'll forget the stuff right away. Uh, so if you want to remember for the long term, you have to use uh, more complex strategies that are in some way harder. And um, so we advocate things um, like retrieval practice, in other words, testing yourself or having someone else test you or taking practice quizzes on online. Yeah. Uh, in textbooks, often there are critical concepts in the back of the chapter. Each chapter will have the main concept of the chapter. See if you can use those in a sentence or write a paragraph about them. If you can't, go back and restudy. Uh, so retrieval practice or self-testing helps you the, the testing itself, the more you can retrieve, the better you'll remember it later. And the other thing it does, um, is to let you know what you know and what you don't know. And so uh, if you read a chapter, you think, well, I know this stuff. But then when you look at one of those key terms, and if the chapter doesn't have key terms, just make them yourself as you read the chapter, uh, or, or ask yourself questions about the chapter that you'll try to answer later. Um, and that's just tremendously important, um, as I say, for both the the cognitive function of improving retrieval later uh, at long times uh, or, and the metacognitive function of saying, okay, here's the things I know so far, here are the things I don't know. Uh, and going back and, and trying, learning again the things, reading again about the things you didn't know. So that's one really good technique. This, this theme of metacognition, I, I saw as somehow quite closely connected with another topic you're discussing, which is you know, taking ownership. So a learner sort of being, being the responsible one who's going to, in some cases, do practical things like draft their own quiz questions. 
or at least commit to and set forward a strategy for the learning. Uh, I want to I want to maybe chat with you about that. A lot of our world centers around the workplace, right. uh, so not the academy, not individual learners, just trying to take things up on on a hobby basis or a personal interest basis, but. Right a context in which you get asymmetries. You have senior people and mid-senior people and junior people. Mm -hmm. um, but metacognition is one of the things that we see a lot of in terms of good learning design. But is it really metacognition if, if those exercises have been designed by the instructor, the trainer, the senior partner, et cetera, and they're being laid on to the young, young learner or does it require the young learner to really be the owner? I think you can have both. I think you obviously need the structure in the first place, <laughs> especially for complicated things. You need a, a, a master who, I mean, in academia, you have the textbook writer and the professor. And, and in corporations, you have, uh, say, if you're trying to be a salesman, you've got very experienced sales people who will tell you, uh, how they've done it over the years, then you'll have to adapt your own strategies that, you know, some personalities might be different from the extroverted salespeople who really <laughs> can walk in cold to an office and make the person a best friend. Uh, not everybody can do that. Uh, so uh, I think uh, both are important. You've got to craft your own techniques but it's good to start off with some experienced guides in the world too. Uh, I'm on the scientific advisory board for three companies that have used these techniques, particularly retrieval practice, to um, aid their companies. That's what they basically do. Uh, so one company uh, <clears throat> called Amplifier now, because that's the name of their product, um, they uh, have uh, programs for quizzing people. So you put in the material and they have an algorithm such that it produces space retrieval practice and mm -hmm. they can measure how fast people forget and try to ding them with a retrieval practice when they think they might be forgetting the information. And they also measure confidence ratings. And so what they especially look for uh, is errors that people make with high confidence. That's especially dangerous. They work, right. for example, in the field of health and hospitals. And so if you have uh, high confidence misinformation and you're a nurse, that can be a big, or a doctor, that can be a big problem. So they yeah. try to uh, <clears throat> eliminate that high confidence misinformation and turn it into correct knowledge. So it's a really interesting company that's doing a lot of things along those lines with different corporations. Quite a number of our clients are in the um, listed stock investing uh, space. Uh, in, in, they, they deploy a few different strategies in that world. That's another place where um, high confidence errors can be, can be uniquely dangerous. Yes. I mean, in that case, let's be fair. It, it, at least there's not there's not health and life at <laughs> risk, but um, it's a lot of money. Huh? <laughs> yeah, when when people yeah. lose when people lose that sense of um, humility uh, about the blind spots that they may have, that's that's usually when you can get into some serious trouble in that world. Right. Well, the stock market usually keeps you honest, though. So you make a high, <laughs> high yeah. you, you know it pretty quickly. <laughs> Yes. Well, I thought, you know, one of the chapters in your book is called Illusions of Knowing. And I thought this, this, this by itself is sort of the, the substance of an entire book. Um, th there's, there's some real power in that idea, kind of the lies that we tell ourselves, or, or let's, let's be more charitable and say maybe the, the fictitious stories that we tell ourselves. Uh, how, what are the roots of this, this idea, the illusions of knowing? Because you know, my, my training originally is in philosophy. So there's, there's a very old history 
of, yes. of people keeping track about the ways we tr trick ourselves and deceive ourselves. Yep. <clears throat> but you have a, this is a very specific language around illusions of knowing. It's very unique to this territory that you cover, which is the science of learning. Um, can you just kind of take me into the roots of that concept and that, well, it's a family of concepts and illusions of knowing? Yes, um, that psycho well, psychologists forever, as well as philosophy, administration illusions that how our mind deceives us. And so <clears throat> most of us are familiar with perceptual illusions that you, you see something and you just can't believe it. Uh, and the person will show you how it's, you're, you're seeing it wrong. Um, and <clears throat> so I tell people, well, look, if you can see things wrong, surely you can remember things incorrectly too, uh, even though we're usually confident in our own memories. Uh, and with good reason. I mean, you couldn't get through life if you weren't pretty confident in what you remember. But in uh, experimental situations and in the real world, um, you can show that uh, often the confidence is not held correctly, that in Legal cases, you can see eyewitnesses who sometimes uh, erroneously or convict a someone of a crime, saying, "Yes, I'm sure that's the person. I I saw that person commit the crime." And it turns out, say through DNA evidence, that later, no, that wasn't a person at all. Um, and so these errors occur in many situations. Education being just one of them, and um, one of the errors, uh, for example simple one is when you read something over and over, you believe you really know it. Uh, because after all, it's very familiar, you're looking at the page, but until you can answer questions about it, do you really know it? If you can't answer questions, you really didn't know it. You might have had the illusion that you knew it perfectly. Uh, so we use the example in the book um, of, uh, I used to teach introductory psychology for about 25 years. And I got so I'd always give a test early in the class because um, I wanted to show students <laughs> uh, might, maybe it wasn't as easy as they thought because they would just read the book and think they knew it. And then if you give short answer essay questions, uh, <clears throat> often they come up blank. Uh, and then uh, I can remember one student who just came to my office and sat down uh, and just burst into tears. I studied and studied and studied. I thought I knew it, and I got a D. Uh, and I would ask, well, how did you study? And they'd say, well, I read the chapter over and over. I underlined, I read my underlinings. And I said, well, look, here's the book. Uh, you know, look at the end of the chapter. Here are practice questions, and here are a lot of concepts. Did you try to answer those? No. I said, well, you know, <laughs> if you try to answer those and you find out you can't, then you need to go back and read with more purpose. And so we discussed for half an hour or so strategies for reading for me, for testing yourself afterwards, for waiting a while, testing yourself again, for doing all that again the night before the test. And she eventually brought her grade right up to an A. So, uh, it's just a lot of people haven't figured out how to study. In high school, they got through by just reading things over and over, and the material wasn't that complicated. The tests were multiple choice, and so they got through. But uh, in multiple choice, you can use simple familiarity. You look at it, and you're, you're on a reading, of course, when you say, oh, that was the word that went with this statement. Uh, but when you're asked to come up with a paragraph explaining say, my world operant conditioning, um, then you've really got to know it. You've got to be able to give an example and you've got to use the terms correctly. You can't just recognize them. You've got to retrieve them. And for that, retrieval practice is great. And that's more like what you have to do to apply the knowledge later. If you want to know how to train your dog, you've got to remember principles of operant conditioning. You can't just recognize them. Yes. Yeah. There's um, one, one of the things that was a little bit of a surprise, maybe an unwelcome surprise to a few, is that 
easy learning is something we should be kind of suspicious of and um, may, maybe not see as a virtue. The fact that some configuration of learning seems like it's beneficial because it comes easy actually could come at a real cost uh, because you you detail in the book, in fact, I'll, I'll just pass it back to you to detail it, it properly because I'll, I'll make a bit of a mash of it. But you detail that the challenges, the actual, the actual effort required in order to achieve certain small learning uh, goals or achievements or little bites, um, the amount of effort is actually part of what lays down a concrete foundation of uh, you know, preventing forgetting and so forth. If, if you if you can just go into that, I really this is something I would really like to share with a number of people, and I'd love to sort of hear your words on it, please. Yeah. So, um, the basic idea here that you're uh, talking about is what in the jargon of psychology we call desirable difficulties, and the finding is that some things that are very, that make learning easy. You look at say, uh, acquisition of the skill. If you do something, let's say you're serving a tennis ball uh, or practicing backhand, that would be a better one for tennis fans, that uh, if you do the same thing over and over and over again, you just practice backhand after backhand, somebody keeps hitting your backhand, you get much better at it. Uh, then the question is, well, when you're really playing though, you don't get backhand after backhand after backhand. Typically you're having to switch back and forth. And so, yes, yeah, some mass practice is good. Some doing it over and over is good to build up the skill a little bit. But after that, you've got to start uh, in sports, they talk about um, uh, practicing, uh, practice like you play and you'll play like you practice, that uh, you've got to, if your eventual test is going to be retrieving material and having to use it, you need to practice that. You can't just read it over and over. Uh, and so um, we use an example in the book of a uh, practicing hitting in baseball. Well, baseball is not a good analogy because people don't play that all over the world. But um, let me, uh, well, let me stick with it anyway because the point will be clear that uh, one of the hardest skills in sports, I think, uh, is hitting a baseball, at least in American sports, because uh, it's coming at you from anywhere from 85 to 100 miles an hour. A few pitchers pitch uh, faster than 100 miles an hour. And the mound is only 66 feet away. And so, or 60 feet and six inches, I've forgotten which it is. Um, and so the ball's on you before you barely know it. And so it's a very difficult thing to hit a baseball and it can occur in different ways and all kinds of things. And sometimes pitchers will fool you and they'll throw it really slow when you're expecting it to be really fast. So how do you practice those things? Well, the way, <laughs> when I was playing baseball, and they still do it now in the major leagues even. They'll, they'll throw you 10 fastballs, then 10 third balls, then 10 change-ups as they're called. And so you get good at them. But in the game, you never see that. I mean, the pitcher is always trying to fool you. You never know what's coming. And so what's important is that you recognize the pitch shortly after it's leaving mm -hmm. the pitcher's hand. And the only way you can do that is through intermixed practice. Uh, or interleave practice, as we call it. So in other words, mixing it up, that's the way it's really going to be in the game. That's the way you should practice it too. After, again, you, yes, you do need a little bit of mass practice to bring things up to speed. But after that, you should practice like you play. And so that means if you're a salesperson, you've got to practice walking in, uh, maybe in your office, into people and practice seeing uh, a sales pitch. If you uh, and to different kinds of people, um, and so same kind of thing. If you've got to retrieve knowledge in order to use it, that's what you need to practice too. Mm -hmm. So it's not. I mean, it makes sense after you explain it to people, but 
um, it's not the way people often say. In fact, if you we've done surveys, it's even for very good college students, they often don't study that way. And the reason is that math practice, if you have a multiple choice test, it will get you through. It's just you won't remember the information very long. Right. There must be there must be some sense in which if say going back to the workplace, you take somebody who's brand new and you throw them into what what ultimately is a very deep, deep end. Let's say something like you need to go and have very successful rapport building conversations with sophisticated clients. There are 75 unique skills firing all at once in that yeah. environment. Roddy, to say nothing of the fact that like with the change ups in, in baseball pitches, the next meeting isn't going to follow the pattern of the previous right. one and so on. So in our experience, when, you, when you're bringing a junior in, into that environment, you do do mass practice for a bit because you teach them the way that a meeting opens and closes. And you say, you sort of say, look, you aren't gonna have to handle the chaos in the middle because it can go any which way, but we'll get you on the piece mm -hmm. that is most consistent, which is the way that this thing opens and closes. And yeah. then you add in, then you add in more complexity and variation. Um, what do you make of that? Do you, do you think that that is approximately the right approach for young learners in the workplace? Or actually, is it making it too easy on them by saying mass practice, you're opening and closing? No, I think it's a good way to go because some mass practice, I mean, you've got to show off learning somewhere. It's when you get more skilled, uh, let's say pro baseball players are then the early leave practice is better. But starting off, you've got to start off with the foundation. I mean, say you're learning uh, addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division in third or fourth grade or wherever you learn that. Yes. But you've got to practice each of those skills a little bit separately, but then try putting them all together uh, at the end. Uh, it's probably not a great example because those are pretty discrete skills. They're easy to recognize by because they give you a sign telling you what to do yeah. and there are only four of them. But in more yeah. complicated things in mathematics, often you see people giving uh, you know, 10 examples of one problem, then 10 examples of the next problem, and so forth. So you get good at each problem. But on the test, you have a problem and you have to figure out, oh, what sort of problem is this? And you've never had to do that if you've had block practice. Um, but coming back to your example, I think training uh, someone in sales or interviewing, giving them, letting them watch. I mean, these are good cases where uh, modeling is good. If you uh, had them watch, say you, you had really expert, some of the best in your company, videotape them doing their performance and yeah. then going through that with a brand new person and pausing and saying, notice what they're doing. Don't just watch the whole thing, but notice how they started. Here are the key elements. Notice the next step when they're going a little bit deeper. Now notice how they pause and ask their questions and so forth and so on. And that would probably be a very effective way. So you're, you're showing them a model of somebody who does it well, but you're stopping to say, here are the things they're doing well. Here are the things you should think about. And mm -hmm. then having them kind of model it. Uh, as they go through it. So it's similar to what you're suggesting, but to me, that would probably be a good way to start off before you, as you say, throw them in the deep end and make them do it themselves. You you um, uh, touch on a lot of the work from Anders Ericsson, somebody who whose work we also incorporate mm -hmm. quite a lot, um, deliberate practice and, and some of the attendant ideas there. Is this a point of departure between you and Anders Ericsson interleaving? Because my, my impression of his writing and work is that he really focused on um, intense focus on very specific, um, well, he, he, he looks at violinists and, um, and number memorization, a bunch of other things, but it still had this tenet, which was intense focus on one thing. 
Am I yeah. right to say this is a, di a diff uh, dis disparity yes, between you? Are. Yes, that's that is a difference. And um, I've had great respect to Andrews and Miles Sadley's past away now uh, and his work, but that is one difference in the way we are talking about that. Um, uh, and even classical musicians have written to us as authors of the book. Uh, and the biggest surprise to them is the whole idea of interleaving and not say playing the same piece over and over again, uh, but mm -hmm. trying to play that piece and another piece, then coming back to that piece, that kind of thing. Uh, mm -hmm. So um, it, it seems that uh, what a lot of evidence shows is that spacing in your practice works. It's like you practice for a while and that consolidates in your brain. We, we believe experiences continue to consolidate after you do them. And that, if, that what's important is a period of forgetting to let the material uh, not really be forgotten, but at least be less fresh in mind and then practice again later. And that seems to be more effective in the long run, not the short run, but in the long run, that seems to be more effective than this intense repetitive practicing the same thing over and over. Mm -hmm. Forgetting forgetting was a very interesting thing for me to come across in, in your writing, Roddy. So uh, I it, it's the first thing that came up on my notes was I need to understand there's something I can tell in the language and the way you talk about forgetting. I would have expected that you would talk about remembering and how to buoy up, preserve, protect um, memory. But actually the language that you use in the book and throughout is, is to stop forgetting. It seemed like, like the mind is, is a bucket full of water and there's all these holes in the bottom and the task is, you know, so, so the forgetting is kind of, is, is a proactive process. Can you just like Tell me why why that why it's that language, the stopping forgetting and, and defending against forgetting as opposed to supporting memory. Yeah, well, they come hand in hand. Uh, that forgetting is natural. We show a tendency to forget most everything. Uh, and so, especially recently learned material. And so you can learn something quite well by heart, as we say thanks to Aristotle, uh, and you then uh, will know it for a while, but often you start forgetting it over time. Now, if you want to remember it uh, well, when, you, when you've forgotten it a bit, relearn it, get it back up to where it was. And then the same thing will happen. This is called successive relearning. Uh, and for something you really want to know cold, um, like uh, Mark McDaniel and I were commissioned by, uh, we don't really know who, but one of the intelligence agencies, yeah. that they wanted us to be able to tell a technique so that, uh, let's say, agents in the field would have 50 uh, keywords or numbers or anything we wanted, we chose words, uh, to remember in order. And so, if they said 25, uh, then the, uh, or table or whatever went with 25, then the person at the other end, the receiving end, would know what they meant. So they would have a word that referred to something. And so we developed a program of successive relearning with using visual imagery. You, you uh, have this list of 50 words, you, uh, we, we developed a mnemonic device for them, uh, but you can just link them by images so that each word has, uh, say they're concrete words, basketball, uh, table, so forth and so on. And you remember that item associated with something. And so if you can remember those 50 words in order, which sounds hard, but using the right mnemonic devices isn't that bad. Um, and then you successfully relearn that. You just keep, so you've got those 50 words. Well, a week later, you're not going to have them. So you relearn them all again uh, using the mind device. Then you wait two weeks and learn them all again, and so forth and so on. 
and eventually you have them, and then you can mentally practice them yourself. You don't need to be tested formally. You can just go over them every day in your mind and have them permanently. So um, it is possible to do that, but uh, instead of just doing it all at once and thinking, you know, block practice, now I have them. Well, it's better to uh, do block practice at first, but then wait till it's forgotten a bit and then learn it again. And that seems to really help things consolidate or reconsolidate in memory. So you have them much better if you space your practice. I hope that answered your question. I'm not positive yet. Well, I think that what one of the challenges that I had and um, I believe that a lot of your readership will have the same challenges. This, your, your topic, learning, applies to so many different types of practices in, in human enterprise. And like I said, we really focus on the workplace. Yep. But just, just in the workplace, you can have technical skill. You mm -hmm. can have soft skill. Right. You can have an amalgam of those things. Um, uh, and and so, uh, and sometimes sometimes it's very physical, sometimes very cerebral. Mm -hmm. um, and so, trying to think about like, well, well, what what is it that you're remembering or forgetting, and why is memory so important? So, take sales as an example. Uh, there were there can be some very specific um, memory, obvious memory drivers, like you need to know features of your products, or you need to memorize stories, use case stories with a certain amount of complexity. You need another story for every key geography, for example, Rodney, right. where where your product has been used so that when people say, well, you know, what would you do for us in India? You can pick it up and run with it. You've got that by recall. But then what is the memory or the or the forgetting challenge around something like having a proactive posture with a client that's angry. You're, you're not drawing on, you're not drawing, you see, it's, it, it's a basket of behavioral skills that you're right. drawing from somewhere, but it's quite a, you're not going through a quick library of memorized yeah. terms or, or, or um, phrases. What, what is your sense for something like that? Say, we'll call it loosely soft skills. But clearly there is such a thing as learning those, improving those, getting better at them. We know that there's a certain amount of practice and commitment like that, but I can't see the connection for memory. Well, you've got to be able to re <laughs> remember that skill and pull it out when you need it. So in some sense, everything is memory. Uh, you know, you've got the person sitting there saying, what do I do now? And so yes. you've got this, I assume, bank of stories and bank of strategies to possibly use. And that is a perfect case where this kind of early practice, you don't need every skill every time. Every every time you go see a client, you don't need every particular skill you in your toolbox, but yes. you need to be able to pull ones out flexibly as you need them. And that to me really is a case where interleaving would help. Now, um, if the company could take experienced sales reps and say, let's try to uh, make these things explicit. Try to come up with all the strategies you use. Um, let's say, you know, you get 10 experienced sales reps and they talk, you give them different scenarios and they say, I did this, I did this, I did this. Uh, and then you make a, a, a list, a basket of all those cases. And again, you could have videos to model these things for people just learning them. And you'd have this variety and then get people to practice those in an early fashion. And then presumably they would be able to go into a situation. They've got to recognize what's happening. That's a big component of it. Um, yes, but, yes, right. And then they've got to consciously say, and maybe it will eventually become kind of automatic, okay, now I need to do such and such. I've got an angry client or I've got a client who says, no, this won't work. What do I do to overcome 
this resistance I'm finding in whatever dimension it is, or can I? And I guess you have to know when to quit to and go on to the next client. Uh, so I've never done sales, fortunately, but uh, that would be uh, one case. Uh, in the companies I advise, um, one uh, had a contract with a shoe company, uh, and selling shoes is awful. Uh, the turnover is very high. Nobody sees it as a life career. Very few people do. But they've got to learn this entire set of products. And so retrieval practice is great for learning the technical side of it, for practicing, okay, uh, if somebody comes in and says they're looking, you know, they're an older adult looking for a walking shoe, what do I tell them? What products would work for that? Right. If it's a young kid coming in saying, I, I want to jog, uh, what shoes would be most appropriate? You've got to know that. So that's the kind of thing where retrieval practice is really good for I think you should be made to work for soft skills too, using the techniques I just talked about, where you try to develop a library of these and yes. expose people to them and then have them practice with an experience. Uh, you can have an experienced salesperson role playing the customer and have the inexperienced person coming in trying to deal with them, something like that. You said you said it, there was a, there was maybe a couple of paragraphs apart where you said two things which, which I can I just wanted to share with you are like very significant um, observations in our world. One of them was that senior people with a lot of expertise don't appreciate or understand how much they know, and so they can look at a given activity and think about it like, hey, look, that's a simple thing that you do there. What's actually happening is they're drawing on several cat card yeah. catalogs of prior um, in, in, ingrained memory and fusing them and 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 acting out, you know, the the yeah. what their learnings. But they don't. They think about it as a discrete single act, and it's not. Um, yeah. So, so that's one thing that we have certainly learned in our field of work. You know, the main, Roddy, what we're doing constantly is helping organizations with how they teach and learn. And one of the great, one of the great challenges is that senior people do not appreciate how much they know. Yeah. <clears throat> so uh, I'll, I'll give the example of a, of a senior, like a partner at a law firm. They may say something like, look, the client has just told you their situation. What you need to now do is break it down. Well, break it down can, can be a tree of, yeah. of skills and knowledge. I mean, they might be drawing on histories of tort law. They might be drawing on a history and a deep understanding of the nature of the sector this client is from, on the, on, on the methodology to break a topic down. Uh, how to verbalize things that are so they're bringing all this stuff into play and if they haven't taken account of that this is this this was something that you mentioned and I thought wow this is profoundly insightful from a place I didn't expect it this happens in the workplace constantly mm -hmm. yeah these experts think that skills are straightforward and and sort of a, a, an atomic size skill set but actually it's an amalgam yeah, the one um, one concept we talk about in the book, which I think is really important, it's called the curse of knowledge. That when you're training somebody who uh, doesn't know anything, you can't place yourself back in that situation when you yes. don't know anything. And uh, you see it in academia all the time. Uh, uh, one of my favorite is calculus teachers. Calculus teachers think calculus is like arithmetic, you know, that anybody should get this. And so they walk in, they just can't understand where the students are and how they need to be brought along. And so, uh, I mean, some of the great calculus teachers can, but most just find it boring to teach calculus because <laughs> they think it's so easy. Uh, and yet they get, and they get very frustrated when the students can't be brought along. And so I imagine you see the same kind of thing in business where the senior people are looking and saying, how can these junior people be so dumb? No, why don't they understand so-and-so? 
Well, they hadn't had the years of experience in knowledge building. And so the real question is, how do you build in that knowledge? And I think uh, conversation in the, that context, obviously, it's not formal book learning, but it's, uh, as you say, the soft skills. But I think they can be learned. And I think a good way of doing it is modeling, which we don't really talk about in the book, but there's uh, literature on modeling behaviors. We all do it, you know, growing up. Um, and um, it's a perfectly good way to, to, to learn, to look at experts and see what they're doing and to break it down. Well, you do you, you do talk about simulations. Yeah, and that's true. That's, that is something that, that happens in the workplace. And I think maybe, maybe if we kind of draw those two things together, er, Erickson talks about this too, where you don't want feedback from any old somebody you want feedback from an expert. You want feedback yeah. from from an authoritative source because they have the eye for it, one, and and they can they can really pick out nuance. Um, but I think in in simulations such as role play, that would be a really classic tool for right. um, consultants, uh, you know, financial advisors, uh, salespeople. Um, role play gives sometimes experts the way to cross over the curse of knowledge because they get they get something very specific to say like you you can't choose the word bigger you can't use the word bigger when you're talking to this client about this kind of situation that is a very bad word choice and so now they're getting down to something as specific as nomenclature or you know diction and it, and it's of great value whereas um, if you weren't doing a simulation they may end up giving this kind of curse of knowledge advice, like, look, right. look, man, you just have to be a better communicator. Yeah. Uh, and and uh, it doesn't help. <laughs> the, the, new, the new fellow doesn't know what to do with it. Simulation is, a, is a, just an absolutely critical um, tool. I, and I, I would love to have, have seen, you know, if, if, I could, if I could be so uh, arrogant, uh, Roddy and, and ask for an extra chapter. I would love to have seen more on that because you talk about it in the case of flight, you know, like a flight simulator, and yep. there's there's one learning context, and then about modeling. Um, but this is a very meaningful tool yeah. in in workplace learning. Yeah. Have you done more work more work on that? I mean, obviously, when you write a book like this, you, it can end up being a library shelf of books if you don't saw it off somewhere. Right. Um, yeah, there's not much work in, in kind of psychology uh, in simulation. There might be an industrial organizational psychology. I would have to look at that. We are working on a new book, by the way. Um, Great. Uh, and what it is, uh, is taking examples. Uh, lots of people have used our book to um, guide themselves in uh, creating courses, uh, for example, uh, I mean, individuals have used it. Uh, it's been used in coaching, been used in music, been used in business. Um, and that's where I'm on the scientific advisory boards of these companies. Um, and so what we're trying to do is collect a lot of our examples. Because a lot of people say, well, I read the book, but I don't know how to apply it in my context. And so we're trying to go from education to business to sports to the military, we went out and gave uh, talks at the Navy SEALs because they'd written us saying, we read your book and we think maybe we're training the Navy SEALs wrong because they used a lot of black practice. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, we went out and talked to the trainers of the Navy SEALs, uh, which was a very interesting two days. But um, we we're trying to write a book that would give a lot of examples of how it's been applied to give just one, last summer we talked to uh, the Dean of Harvard Medical School of Teaching, and they've revamped their whole training program in medical school uh, based on our book and similar work to our book. And they showed us the slideshow, they showed medical students on the first day, and slide three is read this book. <laughs> and it's our book, so that was gratifying. Great. Uh, so, wow. um, anyway, we will have another book eventually, but we're just starting. So uh, I'm not sure I'm working on chapter one myself. 
Well, uh, I can I can put forward to you that if you want anecdotes from Southeast Asia, or yeah. specifically from from the world of professional practice, specifically around the detail of meetings, how to conduct yeah. oneself in meetings with clients, uh, I could I, I could share with you that your principles on reflection, interleaving, and elaboration, those three, cer certainly we could, oh, you know, good. to, to, to the extent that you might be missing any additional examples that we, yeah. we could no, give you No, that plenty. would be great, actually. We don't have anything on meetings right now. That would be great. Maybe we'll come back and interview you if that'd be okay. Uh, <laughs> it, would, it would be a riot. And and whenever that book is done, we, we should meet again and, uh, and, yeah. and make its publication yeah. known. Now, one thing you might do, I, I know you're meeting with me, but Peter Brown, the first author of the book, he was a professional writer. Mm -hmm. um, and the origin of the book, Mark, we were discovering all this stuff in the lab and then applying it. And Mark McDaniel kept telling me, he's just a few doors down, we've been friends forever. We should write a book, we should write a book about all this stuff. And I said, Mark, if you and I write a book, it's going to come off as academic and you know, like our journal articles. Yeah, and it won't. You know, we won't find an audience. We need a professional writer, uh, and so I started talking to Peter Brown, who um, had written uh, both nonfiction books and one pretty well acclaimed novel, uh, made some of the best of the year type books, uh, uh, or type articles in, in our newspapers, and. Um, but you've written a book called Jumping the Job Track about how to strike out from your corporation and be on your own. Anyway, uh, so I asked him, who happens to be my brother-in-law, if he'd be interested in this. And he said, oh, God, I don't know anything about psychology. I never even took a course. And I said, well, Mark, I'll come up you know, with the content. And we'll talk about it. We, we spent days and days talking. And Peter started reading a lot. He finally agreed to do it, obviously. And uh, so uh, we worked very well together, it turns out. Mark had barely met him before we started working together. Uh, but it worked out a very good very good teamwork where Mark and I would try to enunciate the principles. Peter had this wealth of stories he was collecting for other purposes. And then he went out and got more. Uh, and those are the stories in the book with you know the uh, neurosurgeon and so forth and so on. Yes. Uh, so that worked well, but Peter came from a business world. He worked for uh, 3M for years and years. Uh, that's where he met my sister. And then after he finished, he would do, uh, he was a, a mediator in companies that were needed to have a meeting. Maybe they were having problems. Maybe they were in controversies. He would go in and try to mediate and did that very successfully uh, for years. He finally stopped doing that. So he would be a very good one, since you're mostly in the business world, which obviously Mark and I are not in. He might be a very good interview for you too. He's a very engaging fellow. I would absolutely, absolutely. And look, your 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 work is so kind of close to home for us. Um, I was thinking this needs to be a, a series of it, of conversations, and just to cover it all anyway. I would yeah. love to chat with him. I would love to. Sure. I'll, uh, He's, um, I'll, I'll send you his email. I, I'm trying to think if I have your email address or I only have. Uh, yeah, yeah, you, I, you're, I'm copied on at least at least one of the notes we sent okay. you. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll go back and look. There. Okay, I'll send you his email and I'll talk to him and tell him about our conversation. Um, so yeah, uh, hope, uh, hope they'll recommend our book to your companies too. <laughs> Absolutely, no, no. That uh, that's not even that's not even a. You don't have to hope that um, that's going to happen straight away. One one of the things that is going on in the professional world is. Let me see if I can sum this up really nicely. A lot of organizations don't quite know what to do to attract and retain talent, and to develop that talent while they're there. But developing the talent sort of seems like a further goal after just getting them in the door and keeping them. Mm -hmm. um, well, well, one of the things that we have seen in our in our line of work is that, ironically, one of the best ways to keep a young, talented person is to give them 
a very clear vision of what they're no good at. So if you can come along and say, look, here, here is a real shortcoming and they intuitively know if this is real or not, right? If you just pick mm -hmm. something random and it's a bit fake, it's like, look, you need to be more mindful in the workplace or something They kind of shrug their shoulders. <laughs> like, that sounds a bit fake. Where, whereas if you say, if you can point out real professional shortcomings, you can get your mm -hmm. hooks into that person so long as you can, you can provide learning for them on it. Yeah. You, you don't have uh, gravitas in a room and you need to cultivate that with us here over the next six months. Boom, There's no, they, this person is not leaving now because you've had the ability to spot that articulate as a shortcoming plus say, we're going to give you some of the venue and maybe the space and some of the senior people that would be required to build that in. Mm -hmm. So I think um, that that's really, really meaningful. Organizations are really in pain over people coming and then going or the wrong people coming or not even being able to get people in the first place. Mm -hmm. And the business of how you learn, how an organization is going to oversee the way it teaching and learning is done is much more central than than you might think it's not it's not a nice extra that you do afterward it's central to people staying yeah well i notice these days it seems like every large corporation has a chief learning officer yeah <laughs> they, yeah uh, they they've contacted us quite a bit um, um but you know usually just for interviews i never know where these go whether it changes anything or not but um, um yeah i don't want to i don't want to be a stupid about it, but fre frequently when somebody has a role like that they're not <laughs> they're not yet in a position to fully understand nor nor to roll out the kinds of ideas that you have in place mm -hmm. to 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 implement some of the things that you have that, that you you guys articulate in this book requires pretty monumental change inside an organization. Um, but, then, but then there are some other practices such, such as simulation, such as the convention of role play. Interleaving would be the kind of thing, by the way, that is maybe more welcome than it might seem because they're, the nature of work yeah. is that you can't just hang around learning all day. You have to get the hell out of there and you know go take some meetings and make some sales and build some product and, you know, yeah. code up a program. So uh, interleaving and, and breaking up practice. Um, these, so some of these things actually might be, might be welcome. It, okay. it really is um, our, our pleasure to have read this book in the first place. Lovely to, to meet you. There's much more that we need to learn from you. Um, as the new book comes out, we'll, if, if there's any contribution we can make to it, we'd, We'd sure. love to. Um, yeah. So consider um, consider that offer made in earnest thank you. from us. Thank you. Thank okay. you, Ronnie. Have right. a great day. Sure. Yeah. Bye. You too. Bye.